introduction, I welcome you all to the Holistic Health Spring Lecture Series. I'm your host, Eric Pepper, and I'm a faculty at the Institute for Holistic Health Studies at San Francisco State. This lecture series is sponsored by the Institute for Holistic Health Studies, the Department of Recreation, Parks, Tourism, and Holistic Health, and it's offered the second and fourth Friday of the month. The purpose is really of the lecture is to provide holistic health perspectives and approaches that can be used to optimize health and well-being, especially in these troubling times where there's so much sadness and sorrow. The, our, the lecture series also complements what we teach in our classes. And just a reminder for those who are students, the holistic health classes at San Francisco State can fulfill the upper division general education requirements, but offer some minor and certificate in holistic health. And many of the students find that when they take these classes, they really experience a reduction in their stress. They learn healthy ways of coping and they value other cultures and traditions. Well, it's really with much pleasure that I would introduce our speaker. And before doing that, to make it more easy for the speaker, I highly appreciate it. You could turn your cameras on. Remember the session is being recorded. So if you do not want to be shown, then obviously don't put your uh, camera on but it helps the speaker very much as for the interconnectedness. So I would love, I'm really honored to introduce our speaker and my colleague, Jennifer Dubenmeyer, who's a professor at the Institute for Holistic Health Studies. She has been studying the scientific effects of meditation for more than 20 years, and has been immersed in the traditional practice of meditation in Buddhist cultures. So with that introduction, Jennifer, and I ought to give much more of your background, the veto is so long, it would almost fill the whole hour to just talk about that. However, it's with pleasure, Jennifer Dubenmeyer. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Eric. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you for the introduction. Um, my last name actually Dobbenmeyer. It's so easy to mispronounce. Mm -hmm. I, I don't even think I pronounce it correctly from a German perspective. Um, but thank you all so much for taking the time um, to be here today. I would really like this to be an interactive discussion in some ways. I would like to present some meditation myths, but I would also love just to hear uh, people's experience with meditation and their interest in it. And if you'd be willing to put in the chat, uh, if you've been med meditating, how long you've been meditating for, what is your daily practice like? If you're new to meditation, that's great too. Um, uh, just to kind of get a sense of the full spectrum here, I see some colleagues here who have left the practice and, and I see um, some others uh, who I don't know. So I'm just curious if you'd be willing to um, put your experience in the chat and that will also help just kind of tailor the talk a little bit too. Okay, thank you, Mon on and off for about five years. Um, yeah, being consistent is a real challenge. Okay. So a couple people sharing, thank you for that. Okay, wanting to start new new to it wonderful okay tried a few times but would love to get into it more okay great so thank you for that it's helpful to get a little ballpark um and i thought we might just start actually with a little practice to really ground our talk in our bodies and our experience. I don't want this to just to be an academic lecture, but a practice oriented lecture. And I always find it helpful in my students as well to just take a few moments as we kind of transition uh, our attention to this next hour. So if you would be willing to practice with me, I can guide us through a very short practice um, as we begin our, our talk today. And if you want to stretch for a moment, just to raise your arms above your head, maybe wave them side to side, opening up the lungs and the rib cage a little bit, or rolling your shoulders behind you. It's nice to get into our bodies a little bit, 
even massage her arms or her shoulders or her low back. Okay, thank you. So I invite you to be aware of the chair that you're sitting on, however you are. And beginning to feel your seat making contact with your chair, allowing your hands to rest with your palms face down, allowing your back to be straight with its natural curves, the back of the spine, and the vertebrae are stacked on top of one another, allowing the muscles to relax. You can open the eyes or keep them closed. They're open, a soft downward gaze. And it can be helpful just to place a hand on our heart or a hand on our belly and taking a couple deeper breaths and exhaling out any excess tension you may be holding. I'm beginning to feel the body as it moves, the belly rises and falls with your breath. And so we're coming into the body. I'm noticing the breath as it moves through the nostrils. Lean the in and out breath. You may notice the mind wandering, being curious. And inviting attention back to the breath. You may think about your intention for being here today to care for yourself in some way. And to learn something to be able to share with others. Just calling to mind your intention to benefit yourself or others. And having gratitude for yourself for taking this time to practice together and to learn. And as you feel ready, opening the eyes, and perhaps moving the wrists or the ankles, So thank you for your attention and welcome again. Um, if you'd like to put in the chat how that was for you, um, feel free to do that. Um, let's see, and I will share my screen now.
So we've all heard about various benefits of meditation. I'm someone who's been doing research on meditation for 20 some years now, and I've really seen the scientific research explode um, into mainstream culture. Um, newspaper articles and media often share the benefits of meditation. Some of them are listed here. Um, there's many more, uh, certainly um, addressing our, our stress and our anxiety um, is a, a real um, motivation for wanting to practice um, research on depression, on, on disordered eating, on addiction, are all showing positive results. Um, also in terms of our physiological stress responses, um, blood pressure and cortisol levels. Um, research has shown that it can improve our relationship with others, um, our job satisfaction. So there's many preliminary research studies that are showing benefits. More recently, um, this is one study just to show some benefits in college students. Um, as meditation becomes more widespread in our culture, there's a growing industry of meditation apps. Some of you may have tried these yourselves. Um, this one is the Calm app, Headspace is another app. There's a free one called Medito. And I've been curious to see if these meditation apps are effective because traditionally meditation is practiced with a teacher where you receive instruction, often in a group setting, often in a traditional Buddhist context with lots of philosophy and understanding of the, the long-term goals and benefits of meditation. However, in our modern day culture, we might just be feeling stressed out. A friend might have told us, oh, you should try to meditate. Okay, you download the app and all of a sudden here you are trying to learn how to meditate on your own in your own home. <laughs> and so I was curious, are these meditation apps effective? And here's one recent study in college students looking at stressed out college students at Arizona State University, randomized to a waitlist control group and asking them to practice using this calm meditation app for about 10 minutes a day. Lo and behold, they did find some significant reductions in levels of perceptions of stress that were maintained a month after the intervention ended, suggesting some, some important benefits here. People practiced uh, about five minutes a day on average, about 38 minutes a week, which is interesting. Um, we might think that we need to practice a lot more to have benefit, but here this data is suggesting just approximately five minutes a day can be beneficial to us. Um, about half of the people said that it was helpful for managing stress though, so not everyone. There's clearly some variability here. And there was no improvements in sleep or health behaviors often affecting students such as binge eating or drinking. Um, so my takeaway from this study is that there's some, some, just some, some, some research that suggests these apps could be helpful, but yet also perhaps some limitations with only about half saying it was helpful for them personally. Against the backdrop of our interest in meditation is this growing huge $4 billion industry of meditation apps. It's expected to be 4 billion in um, the next five years. So this is a huge um, capitalistic enterprise um, where people are um, providing the service of learning how to meditate right? and providing this app and making it sound really good. And oftentimes we see images like this of a very kind of, you know, attractive, often white female in a meditation posture against a nature scene looking very serene and peaceful. Oh, and if I just sit like that and I just kind of clear my mind, you know, I will experience all this calm and bliss that this advertisement suggests. So my experience, however, teaching a meditation class to students is very different 
And so this is what my talk is about, some lessons that I've learned and some common meditation myths that students and others carry with them about meditation as they're trying to learn, which can actually make it more difficult for them to practice and sometimes make them want to give up. So one of these first meditation myths I wanted to mention today is probably one of the most common ones that I hear. And this is that the goal is to have a blank mind. Has anyone heard of this before or thought this? I'm just curious, you can raise your hand. Um, and a lot of students come in with this that we need to have a blank mind. This is the goal of meditation practice. However, when we sit down to meditate, and if you've ever sat down to meditate, and maybe just a few moments ago when we were meditating together, you may have noticed a lot of thoughts popping up, like in this cartoon here, these different thought bubbles popping up. It could be anything and everything, you know, what I need to do, that I'm hungry, why didn't she call me back? Um, and so this is referred to as our monkey mind in uh, the meditation tradition, a monkey is an animal that is very stimulated by appearances and, and it kind of jumps from tree to tree. Um, whatever they see, they want to kind of grasp and, and cling onto. And so our mind is, is jumps around like monkeys sometimes. And so you may have observed this. So this is kind of the first myth that we think we have to have a blank mind. Then when we start to notice that our mind isn't blank, that it's jumping around with these thoughts, the second myth that we tend to think is that I'm doing it wrong. <laughs> I can't meditate. Has anyone thought that? I'm just curious, had that feeling. Um, however, when people say that, I actually say, well, if you are seeing what's happening in your mind, if you're seeing how busy your mind is, you're actually doing it right. <laughs> this is mindfulness. This is the practice. We are seeing what's actually happening in our mind in real time. And so it might not be as we expect, right? And we might judge ourselves. Right? And that's just another thought. <laughs> But if we're aware of we're judging ourselves, that is the practice of mindfulness. So we're beginning to kind of look under the hoods of our, of our minds, of our brains, if you will. We're starting to see the engine of how thoughts are produced. And instead of habitually following after them like we usually do, we're taking a step back and we're looking. Our minds have this awesome capacity to observe itself. Our minds can observe itself directly, right? So we have a front row seat to what's happening inside our minds, see? And this is illuminating, right? This is knowledge. Knowledge is power. We're beginning to see what's really going on. And so this is good news right? because we're not blindly following after our thoughts we're starting to see how they develop, okay? And so this is a practice known as calm abiding or shamatha is a Sanskrit term um, for it. And this practice that we opened with of bringing our attention back to the breath, or back to the body. You can also use a mantra. I saw someone in the chat is using a sacred sound, a word or syllable, repeating a phrase. That is also a type of concentration practice. Um, or we can have a visual cue such as a candle or a sacred image, um, or even an image in our minds. Um, the Tibetans often will use imagery practices. They may imagine a Buddha in their mind. That might be the focus of their meditation practice. And so with calm abiding practice, we are bringing our attention back to this object. Our thoughts will wander off because that is the nature of thought and mind. It's, it's ceaseless. 
we can't control it. It will just pop up. And so we notice when that happens. And that's actually a moment of awakening. It's a moment of mindfulness when we realize that we've been lost in thought for five minutes. <laughs> and then we bring our attention back to the breath. Very gently, like we are training a puppy, Jack Cornfield says, um, who's a meditation teacher at, at Spirit Rock in Marin. And so this takes a lot of practice. We're used to wanting quick results fast and perhaps forcing things. And here we're learning a different kind of skill. We're learning to uh, step back, to allow and to relax and have patience. Sometimes our thoughts can be really sticky though. You know, we can be really engrossed in them. Maybe there's a real problem that we're working on that has our attention. Maybe something really upset us and we're just kind of consumed with this thought, right? Um, and so that's just important to acknowledge that thoughts can vary in the sticky quality that they can have. But there's no reason to judge some thoughts of good or bad as we're doing this practice. Um, we, the goal is just to bring our attention back. And as we cease following thoughts, the thoughts will become fewer and fewer in between. And gradually, our mind becomes more still like a, this uh, placid lake in this photo where you can see the reflection of the mountain. So a traditional analogy is that when we first start to practice, our mind can be like a waterfall, like we're standing underneath a waterfall and there's this rush of maddening thoughts and it's overwhelming and it almost feels like we're drowning in our thoughts. But as we continue to bring our attention back to the breath and not follow after those thoughts, they begin to settle down. It becomes more like a rushing river and we're sitting alongside the shore watching this river. And then that river becomes more of a trickling stream and then finally that trickling stream becomes this placid clear lake. But this is a process, you know, this takes time. In the traditional meditation literature, it's known as this nine stages of shamatha practice. The first stage is maybe placing your attention on your breath for one breath and then two breaths and then three breaths and then 21 breaths and then maybe a hundred. So it's a very slow going process and that's helpful to appreciate that we can't expect to sit down and, and be um, experts. We can't be a Mozart at a piano the first time we sit down to learn how to play a scale. But being calm is not the end game of the practice, um, even though that's the name of the app, the Calm app, right? That is kind of the starting point from a Buddhist perspective. Because once our mind is calm, you can think of it as a microscope being steady. Now we have a steady base on which we can zero in and look um, with higher resolution about what's happening. We can see the more subtle aspects of our mind. And so this is known as insight or clear seeing or sometimes special seeing. So we're not just calming the mind to kind of chill out and zone out. We're calming the mind so that we can have greater clarity to see what is happening in our experience and reality itself. And so we learn to become curious. And sometimes there's this practice of labeling our thoughts. Um, you know, a thought comes up, maybe anger comes up. Okay, this is anger. This is, I'm feeling angry now. We're not trying to get rid of the anger. Right? We're not trying to judge it as good or bad. We're being really curious, like we're a Martian from out of space, experiencing anger for the first time in the body and the mind. And so this act of, of labeling our, our thought, um, we are less identified with it. And we're activating certain prefrontal uh, cortex areas of the brain, which can um, deactivate the stress um, aspects of the um, stress related aspects of the brain, such as the amygdala. So, there's been some scientific research on this to show the benefits of labeling our thoughts and feelings. And so, we can also realize that these thoughts come and go, they're temporary and 
uh, during formal practice, we can just allow them to pass. And so this photo here is kind of seeing what's at the bottom of that clear lake. We can start to see all the, the muck and um, all of our, you know, all of the emotions that we've had to suppress that we haven't been able to become conscious of are kind of lying down there. So as we get calm, things will start to bubble up that we haven't paid attention to in a while. Okay, so this third meditation myth I wanted to mention today is that we often might think that meditation is supposed to feel good. After all, that's why we wanna meditate because we're not feeling good. We're feeling very stressed out, right? And we might experience a taste of it or a friend may have told us about how relaxing they feel. Right? And so, Yes, we do have those tastes of, of meditation. However, as we continue to sit, eventually we're gonna encounter some restlessness and some discomfort. It's just part of the process. It's part of having a human body in mind. Um, but what's tricky here, we can fall into this trap of starting to chase after those good experiences, those kind of moments of calm or bliss that we might have. And ironically, when we do that, when we create this expectation, we're creating some kind of effort and hope and we're striving. And that actually is taking us further away from the actual experience that we're looking for, which is to be calm and peaceful. So it's practicing, you know, with each each new time you sit, letting it be fresh, having a beginner's mind, not expecting um, it to be like it was last time. It's important to realize as we are sitting that we're kind of going through a detox process. We're letting go of our normal habitual patterns of being busy, of how we respond to stress, um, of feeling anxiety. And so that is gonna take some time to unwind itself. So sitting can actually bring up physical discomfort. And this is where we have to really allow ourselves um, to feel discomfort. And as that discomfort arises and it passes, this is when we begin to experience um, more peace. Okay. So, I hope that's making sense and we can talk about after. I'll leave some time for questions afterwards. Um, a fourth meditation myth. Um, meditation is an escape. Um, you know, we just want to <laughs> escape from our problems or we want meditation to kind of solve our problems to fix some ourselves. Right. But in any case, we just kind of want to get out of our lives. Right? We just kind of want to escape. But and actually, we're coming closer to ourselves. We're coming closer to our actual experience. And so Pema Chodron um, is an American Buddhist nun, and she's written a lot of popular books on meditation and Buddhism. Some of you may have heard of her. And she is really famous for this idea of leaning into our discomfort, of staying present with it. And she says that this uh, discomfort, this very moment is our perfect teacher. And she has this quote here, when life is uncomfortable, that's the most difficult time to stay present, but that's also the time when doing so could be the most rewarding. What, you know, how can that make sense, <laughs> right? Um, so we think that discomfort is bad news. We just wanna get away from it. We seek comfort, we seek pleasure. We try to avoid discomfort. This is what unites us with most species on the planet. But as humans, she's saying, this is our teacher. We have the possibility to learn from our discomfort. And how is that? Um, how can we see our discomfort as a teacher? 
because she says, we see how we're holding on to our thoughts, which are causing us to suffer. So we're seeing the cause of our suffering. If we see the cause of our suffering, we be can begin to unhook ourselves from it. But we have to see it first. So we get to see how we try to escape from our suffering, how we try to distract ourselves. You know, do you go to your phone or social media? Do you work more? Are you, um, you know, avoiding your feelings by throwing yourself into a project? Do you go to food? Do you try to soothe yourself um, with drinking or eating in some way? So we get to see how we try to escape from our feelings. Or maybe we indulge, maybe we um, just go into really pitting ourselves and thinking we're the worst person in the world and, and looking for confirmation of that idea in some way. Right? And so the invitation here is not to indulge or to suppress, um, but to be aware, to see them and just to let them be. And so this can be really scary in a way because we're letting go of our familiar habits. Even though our habits might be painful and uncomfortable, they're at least predictable. And that brings a sense of security. And so by not giving into our usual pattern, we're kind of opening up, we're going into a free fall, we're we're, we don't know what will happen next. Right? And that's a very tender place to be, opening to this unknown place, um, giving up any idea of hope or fear. Yet this is what we're being called to do in this practice. Okay. Um, any just kind of thoughts or questions or reactions so far? I know I've been saying a lot and is anything coming up for anyone at this point? It's kind of curious. Um, I, I have one thing, but um, it was kind of about the slide before. Mm -hmm. You were saying how I've never heard someone say, like I've always heard meditations just to make you feel good, be calm. And then you explaining that you don't have to feel good makes it seem like more approachable almost. And because I feel like I've always... Um, liked meditating when I'm feeling good already but if I'm not then I'm like oh I don't I don't want to do it um so it's kind of nice to like think about it in this way and reframe like the way you think about it yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah thank you for sharing that yeah oftentimes people just want to meditate when they feel like it <laughs> right yeah and so and it can be and so it's nice to kind of have a daily practice where we're practicing whether we feel like it or not eventually, you know, and then we have that foundation and then it's there for us um, when things get hard, you know, we're kind of less reactive because we have a foundation of practice. Thank you, Jenna. Okay. All right. So I've got a couple more and then we'll open it up more generally. A fifth one that I hear often, I don't have time to meditate. <laughs> I'm too busy. Um, so this is common and lots of um, ways to approach this one. I have a quote here from Ajahn Chah, who's a, a Theravadan meditation teacher in the UK. He says, if you have time to breathe, you have time to meditate. So what does that mean? Um, basically, we can meditate as we are walking, as we're doing the dishes, as we are driving. We can just shift our attention, becoming aware of what's happening in our bodies in that physical moment. Right? Yet oftentimes when we feel that we, are, um, we don't have time to meditate, we're almost addicted to our speediness, that our, our fast paced lives have a certain momentum and we feel kind of powerless to um, interrupt that momentum. And so it can take a lot of effort to slow down, to, to you know, kind of go to zero, to 
might feel like slamming on the brakes and that just might feel too jarring or too difficult to do. Um, so that's really important to realize as we're starting out, realizing that the busier we are, it can feel harder to meditate. Yet just taking a pause, just breathing, taking three deep breaths, um, that pause can actually be very profound even though it's very brief because we are stepping out of our automatic pilot. Um, and just in a flash, um, we can have a new insight, right? And we can feel what it feels like to be in our bodies. And so we're less up, caught up in our minds and all of a sudden we're just dropping into the present moment. But it's important to recognize that this can uh, take time and practice. But if anyone does feel like they're too busy to meditate, I may start off just saying, okay, just when you're walking around your house, when you're walking outside, just be aware of your feet on the ground or your breath as you breathe in and out. So just incorporating brief moments into what you're already doing and seeing what that's like. Okay. Um, and then the last, I think this is the last one. Maybe I have one more. Um, there are no side effects to meditation. We often hear this a lot from people, um, you know, professionals will, will say this, um, reporters will say this, yet, and they will often compare it to medications, for example, for depression or anxiety, you know, medication can have a lot of side effects, but if you meditate, there's no side effects. While scientists didn't really measure side effects of meditation <laughs> for the majority of our studies for a very long time, it actually took one of my colleagues, Will Willoughby Britton at Brown University to start asking people, <laughs> do you have any adverse side effects when you practice? And when you ask people, you start to hear about different stories. She even interviewed different meditation teachers across the country for their stories. So she has um, collected many, many stories of people sometimes having very long traumatic side effects of meditation, others more temporary passing effects. But there's a new movement that's been developing in the mindfulness world, and this is called trauma-sensitive mindfulness, realizing that uh, many of us have had some kind of traumatic life experience that has felt very life-threatening um, in some way. Um, maybe we, you know, were, had something in an abusive relationship or maybe we witnessed an accident or we were in an accident. Um, sometimes veterans have post-traumatic stress disorder. And so when we sit down to practice, those unprocessed memories and feelings can bubble up and they can become really overwhelming. And it can exasperate symptoms of trauma. We might start having flashbacks. Um, we might start crying uncontrollably and not know why. We might um, have a hard time sleeping. Um, we might be preoccupied with this past event. Um, we might have a physiological stress reaction. Our heart rate might accelerate. Um, we might start feeling sweaty or breathing shallow. We might start feeling more anxious or we might start to feel more numb or dissociated, kind of checked out, zoned out, hard to um, think and plan and execute our daily routine. So it's really important to think about staying within our window of tolerance. This is a concept uh, that David Chavelin has uh, developed as a graduate of CIS. Um, a school here in San Francisco. And being aware if we're getting too aroused or too hypo aroused, kind of that feeling numb or dissociated feeling. And that if it ever feels like too much, you have permission to not do the practice, to take a break, go for a walk, uh, talk to a counselor, a therapist, or a trusted friend, or someone in your religious community, um, to not go through this alone and to realize that this can come up, that this is 
um, a common kind of experience. And so we don't want to think of meditation as this cure-all, like it's going to cure all of our problems, our stress in our lives. We need to know how to use it appropriately. And choosing not to practice, I would say, is actually part of our practice because we're feeling into what's right for us at that moment and making decisions. And so we're actually using some mindfulness to do that practice. Okay. All right, so the last one here is, I feel like I am wasting my time. <laughs> I could actually be doing something. I could actually be accomplishing something, but here I am sitting here doing nothing. And so I think this is a symptom of our our culture, which is very um, production oriented. Um, we feel oftentimes our self-worth is tied up with our, the feelings of what we can produce. Um, and we do have a lot of demands on our plate, um, not to deny that, but to also balance that with appreciating taking time for being. Um, we need to be able to recharge our batteries. We need to be able to become centered so that we can engage more meaningfully and effectively um, in our lives when we do act, right? And so this time is actually a chance for us to be with ourselves, right? We're not interacting with others, a screen device, you know, our job. It's just me, myself, and I sitting here and developing a relationship with ourselves. Oftentimes we can be very hard on ourselves, very judgmental and be our own worst critic. And here we're beginning to develop a sense of friendliness towards ourselves. Pema Chodron calls this um, Maitri, um, a Sanskrit term. She translated, translates it as unconditional friendliness for ourselves. And if we really want calm or peace in our lives, we need to develop this unconditional friendliness towards ourselves right? and not to struggle against the pain in our life or judging ourselves or expecting perfection from ourselves all of the time. Right? It's inevitable that we will experience setbacks and disappointment, all of us do. Um, and so we're coming into contact with the human experience. And so as we kind of let go of this idea to try to fix something, to fix ourselves, to improve ourselves, we are just allowing ourselves to be, to settle. And that's where we find this natural wellspring of well-being in our natural being. We have this natural quality of mind that's naturally aware, naturally present, it's effortless, but we need to allow that to manifest by giving, giving it space to be. Okay, I think, all right. So I think okay. those are the myths, yeah. Um, so I know that was kind of lot. so I kind of want to open it up to questions. And any questions you might have about your practice or about meditation in general, or going back to something I said, um, just curious what's resonated with you. Um, thank you, Juan Carlos. Would you like to share a little bit more about what you appreciated? Sure, and sorry, I'm, I'm in a place where I can't really put my camera on. Um, <laughs> so you get to look at my picture. <laughs> but uh, what I appreciated about uh, what you just discussed is some of the things that I started to turn up on my own in terms of doing the practice that I didn't have words to express. And, you know, I felt like I was doing it wrong. And so hearing your words is helping me clear my mind of those ideas. And hopefully this opens up a uh, space for me to delve a little deeper into this practice. Uh, and I love what you said about um, not choosing not to practice is part of the practice too, because we have to have the license to say when something is not feeling right to stop even though it might be intended to be helpful or healthy or uh, a good thing to do, et cetera. So thank you for all that. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you thank so you much. Thank you so much. Oops, here. Uh, 
that's exactly what we're doing. We are learning to become our own teacher ultimately by listening to ourselves, right? And figuring out what we need and, and when and investigating. So we'll hear things, our teachers will say something, but it's really up for us to investigate and make decisions for ourselves. So thank you for mentioning that. Um, uh, Yanis, thank you, Yanis. Thanks for joining today. The concept of permission, including saying no when we don't have the capacity to practice. Yes, yes. I think this is especially important too with this huge billion dollar meditation industry where it sets these huge standards for us. Right? So we're kind of em empowering ourselves. Other kind of comments or reactions or questions, something you've been wondering about meditation. There was a lot of other practices I didn't cover. And, you know, there's also a loving kindness kind of meditation that I didn't talk about, which is very different from the calming practice where we're letting go of thoughts with the loving kindness meditation. Some of you may have heard of this. Has anyone heard of a loving kindness meditation? Curious here. Um, this is when we are actually um, inviting in thoughts and memories and cultivating a uh, loving attitudes towards others. And so that can also be a really powerful practice. I encourage you to check out that practice sometimes. Um, there's lots of loving kindness meditations available as well. Let's see, we're all kind of... All right. Well, we've got about 10 minutes left. I'd like to have some discussion, some thoughts. Um, Rick. Hey, Jennifer, thanks again for leading us and for bringing us down to earth and, and uh, grounding us. I also was curious about the um, side effects comment because I remember depending on the time of day, Sometimes just before bed, I could use various meditative techniques to calm and soothe. And sometimes things would creep up and keep me up later than I thought. And so that's the, the when things happen. And I didn't know if you had any thoughts along the, the lines of the, I'm going to call it emotional focusing. That's Eugene Gendlin's work, University of Chicago, about how do we, um, sometimes we think they're a meditative technique, but they might unpack a can of worms uh, maybe even unintentionally. Yeah, there's some interesting literature on meditation for sleep. Some studies are showing that it can um, improve sleep duration. Um, other studies suggest that it can be disruptive. So the literature is mixed on that. Um, and I think we're still un unpacking why. Um, maybe a shorter practice, um, just enough to kind of relax the, the physiological stress system can be beneficial. But sometimes like you're saying, you can, it can open up a can of worms, right? And keep you up at night. And so if you are finding that to be happening, um, that's a, a good thing to consider about the win of meditation. Maybe I find that I don't sleep as well right before bed. And so maybe it's better if I practice in the morning, for example when I'm more fresh in the day. Um, you could also think about the kind of meditation practice. Maybe if you do a body scan practice where you're not thinking about, um, where it's more guided around um, kind of awareness of the, of the body, you could see if that has a different um, effect at nighttime, that could be um, a different practice to try. Um, but, Certainly, um, you're not alone. That is a common effect um, that meditation 
can um, can be activating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So I think Eric has his hand up, but he didn't use the raise hand. Okay, Eric. Superb presentation. I'll make comments later. Uh, the question I would say is in our individualistic society, we're now moving to using apps. Many people now often use apps by themselves, which almost increases the singularity and the separateness. And yet much of meditational history has always been in groups or with teachers, which give social support. Any suggestions, comments about that kind of paradoxical use of apps possibly? Yeah, I'm really concerned about it. I would encourage people to practice uh, in a group as they can to, there's a lot of uh, meditation organizations around, especially in the Bay Area. Some are more secular, some have a more Buddhist flavor, but having that one-on-one -on -one connection with a teacher is really important to help guide the student. Um, it's getting that feedback. We need a teacher. Um, this idea that we can just learn on our own um, is, is concerning a bit. With the um, Calm app study that I shared, they provided some educational videos at the beginning, so they got some training. So it suggests that the apps can be you know, somewhat helpful, but I would say it's not enough in the long run. You know, It's, it's a great place to start, but please seek out the social support in the community. You know, traditionally in, in the Buddhist, you know, it's the teacher, it's the teaching, and it's the community, you know, of support. Those are the three jewels that, that Buddhists would take refuge in, um, that we learn that we're not alone, we lean on each other. Um, okay, and so let me see, there's a question in the chat here. Um, any suggestions how I can get started with practicing? Any helpful resources for beginners? Thank you. Okay, great question. Um, so here I am. <laughs> Will I recommend the app? <laughs> um, I would also, you know, start with the app, but I would recommend a place like maybe like the East Bay Meditation Center or the San Francisco Dharma Collective, I think it's called. Uh, Spirit Rock, there's lots of online offerings um, and online uh, Zoom group meetings. Um, so I, you know, and given the research that I just pr proposed, you could try the app. You could try the Calm app, yes, and find what works for you. Some people will like a certain person or a certain voice and some people won't. So if it doesn't resonate you with right, right away, try something else. And maybe try to find a friend who's been practicing for a while and talk to them about it. So you can have like a buddy um, or, and someone to ask questions to. Is that helpful? Let me add one comment to that because I think Jennifer is very humble, by the way in talking about this, she's also teaches at San Francisco State, she's a, she's a professor there, and in fact offers a superb class where you would learn these techniques. And we have other classes there as well, which you have other flavors of meditation. So if you are a student at San Francisco State or you wanna take one of the classes, it'd be a great way to do it. And you would go through the whole semester. So you develop both having a, a mentor, a teacher, as well as having social support from other students. Yeah. Okay. Much too humble, Jennifer. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Yeah. So yeah, for the students here, um, I do teach a holistic health meditation and healing class. Uh, so you can earn credits <laughs> for learning how to meditate. And we do have some um, meditation tracks on our holistic health YouTube channel too. You could try. Yeah, Umala. Thank you, Jennifer Law. That was an excellent presentation really from content and every, every point of view. I would just add to, if a person is frustrated, as you said, there are many different types of meditation. Yeah. So from the Chinese medicine point of view, Ayurvedic point of view, Tibetan medicine point of view, we have different doshas. We have different constitutions of our physical body and our mind. So, and, and 
similarly in Western physiology, we have two hemispheres of the brain. Yeah. So, so what may be successful, a successful technique for one person may not fit as well to another person. Yeah. So we just yeah. keep that in mind. Yeah, thank you so much for raising it. It's a really good point. And um, so if we, and sometimes we might feel really restless if we have an attention deficit disorder, um, and perhaps a walking meditation may be more beneficial for us at first than a sitting meditation. Um, if we are feeling uh, really kind of lethargic and sleepy a lot, maybe a, a walking meditation is better for us than a sitting meditation. Maybe we feel that we are, have a lot of anxiety and we feel very ungrounded. Maybe a lying down meditation, uh, like a body scan meditation is helpful for us. Maybe we feel uh, we have a lot of anger and aggression and very competitive. Maybe a loving kindness meditation uh, would be beneficial for us. So I think this will be the next wave of meditation research. I'm actually hoping um, to think about these individual differences and in tailoring practices um, to benefit people. Yeah. Well, Jennifer, I want to thank you. I think we're coming near the end of the program. I want to truly thank you for an outstanding presentation and really the real pragmaticness and being much broader and really covering a very large scope in a very pragmatic way. You know, I really love, you know, to realize that we meditate, we can do it anywhere, even when I'm walking or when I get upset. If I can just catch myself and become the witness, that's the beginning part of awareness where we can keep moving. I thought it was just really phenomenal. Thank you. Uh, and I would invite all, all of us or all of you to attend some of the other holistic health classes next spring or next fall. It's spring now, next fall. And that should be great. I'm just going to put up for a moment. But before I put it up, I just want to give a big applause metaphorically to Jennifer. You can all do this. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it is pragmatic, common sense and open for everyone. And then let me put the next slide up for a moment on the screen. And that is to sort of invite all of you for the next two upcoming presentations. One is by Eric Pepper, who will talk about the, the importance of breathing, how to improve health and well-being with breath. And then on May 13th, a lecture on or presentation on transforming and healing through travel as we're moving through the summer. And finally, for all of you, for those who are intrigued in holistic health practices or not want to know more, you feel disconnected, feel more stressed, or want to just learn about optimum health, enroll in holistic health and recreation parks and tourism classes. For more information, contact the Institute for Holistic Health Studies or Rick Harvey. Here's his email. That's rharvey at sfsu.edu or on the web, sfsu.edu forward slash delta. IHHS. On that note, I thank all of you for participating, and I look forward to seeing you at the next presentation of the Holistic Health Lecture Series. And again, Jennifer, thank you so much.